going on in life that are going to upset your apple cart. Now, maybe you don't have an apple cart, and maybe you don't know what I'm talking about, but the idea that you have an apple cart is one of, you have everything all in order. You have everything set up just the way you want it. Just about the time that you think you're going to do something just a certain way, it gets messed up. And that's kind of like what they mean by knocking over your apple cart. Because back in the old days, they used to have a, a wagon. And on that wagon was apples. And they would push this wagon, you know, and the old picture from like the Rockefeller pictures or whatever they are, they would take it like on the street corners. And you could still see it in New York sometimes or maybe overseas in a open air market or maybe in a movie or television that you see these stands that have fruit and the fruit is all stacked up in a nice, neat, orderly way so that you can examine them and you know, buy them. And then somebody comes along and knocks it over. That kind of messed up the thing, didn't it? Well, it's not that God really comes and knocks over your apple cart. It's just he knows it's going to get knocked over. Because <laughs> he knows everything. So because he knows that, he kind of has a plan about it. You know, he says, well, you know what? Michael's been working on his apple cart for quite a while now, you know, and he's got it all set up this way he likes it, you know, and I've been trying to talk to him and whisper things in his ear about, watch out for the apple cart. Watch out for the apple cart. Watch out, it might get knocked over. And uh, he ain't paying attention. So I tried to tell him, and sure enough, Bam! Your apple cart gets knocked over. In other words, something interrupts your normal routine and you got to pick up the apples. You got to clean up the mess. You got to change your routine. You got to do something different. And that's what life's about, you know, is always being able to adapt to that. Because Jesus tried to tell us that if you want, you know, like to be regimented, you know, I mean, go out and be a farmer. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, you know, Burrows, straight, rows, but uh, tractor. You know. But uh, he said that the wind blows whither it will. You need to know where it's coming from or where it's going. So too is everyone led by the Spirit of God. So he was trying to tell you that, look, in your life as a born-again Christian, you are going to come into contact with my will versus your will, and you won't know what to do with which will, the way, and as the wind goes, that I want you to go. So you'll try to be figuring it out, and you'll go the wrong way, and I'll bring you back the right way. And sometimes it'll go a different way, and the circumstances will bring you this way, and that way, and up and down, and, you know, your life's going to kind of go... So whenever people try to tell you that life is meant to be just one steady climb, and it's just so smooth sailing, don't buy it. Because... They may look like it, they may talk like it, they may walk like it for a while. But I'd say, oh, give it about 39 years, long about the 40th year, something big is going to happen to them. Because <laughs> there used to be this old idea that, you know, you would go to a job and you'd work it for your lifetime and there was a career of a father and a son and a father and a son and this never-ending succession of, automatically, just one right after the other, doing the same thing. But when you look closer in history, except for nowadays they're trying to rewrite history, but anyways, besides the latest fundamentalist books on the new kind of Christianity, that everything was God and there were no atheists. But uh, when you look at history of anybody, any human being, any person, any people, any nation, it's a question of changes constantly happening of crisis of moments of non-uniformity but catastrophism catastrophic upheavals that are happening and the thing that made it so different or that made a nation christian was that it was able to adapt to that 
and to use that to see God in it and to move as God chose to. Because God pointed out in Genesis all the way up through the end of Revelation that a lot of these catastrophes aren't natural disasters. They're God-ordained, planned out, coordinated, designed effects from a fallen world that is going to go into all kinds of disasters, but that God is using it for his own purpose. Now, I'll admit, most of the time when you hear somebody go, well, there is a hurricane over there, you know, in San Juan Capistrano, or San Juan, Puerto Rico. You gonna tell me God sent that? And you'll hear most pastors tell you, no. You know, then they'll some point down the road say, well, you know, God uses the circumstances in order to bring about his purpose and his design, but it's a fallen world and that all these things are consequences of the fallen nature and the fallen world and that the curse that's on creation causes all these things to happen in such a way that they automatically will create all these different weird kind of like environmental cause and effects, but God uses them for his purposes and design. Well, then did God send it? We see it's kind of more like God knows it's going to happen, then he uses it for his purpose because he upsets the apple cart. Now, admittedly, if you build your house in a hurricane zone, you're going to get a hurricane sooner or later. If you build your house in a floodplain, you're going to get a flood sooner or later. If you build your house upon a rocky, <laughs> build your house upon, if you build your house upon a sandy land, sooner or later, you're going to get flooded out. But if you build your house upon a rock, you're going to get an earthquake. <laughs> oh well, because Jesus said, look, this isn't your home. This isn't meant to be your security. You're not supposed to feel as though you've got it all together and that life is always going to go on in a nice, neat, orderly way. No, as a matter of fact, he says that you will have tribulation. You will have challenges. You will have apple carts turned upside down. You will lose your job. You will lose your house. You will lose your loved ones. You will lose a brother or a sister. You will do all these things for my name's sake. Because, let's be real, you and I, we put a lot of things in front of our Lord. We get attached to them and then God says, hey, I'm moving it out of the way. Now, you may get some of those things back as God gives them to you. But, you have to, at some point in time, kind of like remove yourself from them so you're not attached to them. So that you're not consumed or possessed by the world and its ways, but that you're rather ready, re rather ready to go to the Lord and His place so that we can leave all this behind. Because we're not meant to occupy the world in a way of permanent kingdom but more like the Occupy that you see with people living in tents. You're temporarily there. You're not meant to be there permanently. You're passing through this world. You are a citizen of heaven. Your citizenship is in heaven. You have a home and a place being prepared for you. When it's time to go, you don't look around for what's behind. You don't be Lot's wife. So, don't get attached to anything, whether your ministry, your church, your people, your wife, your car, your dog. Don't get so close. Love them, but don't be possessed by them. Now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed, you shall be glad also with exceeding joy. The exhortation speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Now, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So the challenges of life are meant to come at you. They are the chastening of the Lord. Let's be real. 
You can say natural circumstances happen, but what is God's purpose in them? It's not God's purpose in the storm sometimes to always remove you from it or to protect you from it or to do all these other things about it. Sometimes the things in life, the storms of life, are coming to you to chasten you, to teach you, to instruct you in the way that you should go, to cause you to understand God in a more personal and intimate way as being not just your refuge and your strength, but your provider. That, hey, though he slay me, yet shall I trust him. In other words, learning the Job experience is one of the most beneficial things you're going to ex come across in life because if you're a 20-year-old, let's just be real. When you're a 20-year-old, you feel like you can go out there and conquer the world and do anything you want to. You feel like you got it all, you know it all, and you're going to do it all. You know it. Frankly, so did I, you know? And then one day I was told I wouldn't live past 30. My 20-year-old self-confidence went <laughs> crashing down. And I had no confidence in living past 30 because, frankly, I was dying. And it took a long, drawn-out time of dying two or three times before I lived. And the funny thing is, it don't make much sense either. You know, you're saying, why is that guy alive? <laughs> he should have been dead a long time ago. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's God. But, you see, that's what God wants us to recognize in his chastening. Because God broke me to make me into who I am today. For without that dying literally, physically, emotionally, and all spiritually, I would not have become the person that I am today. Is that so good? Good question. You'll have to figure that one out. God knows. But I rejoice afterwards in having gone through 10 years of miserable suffering, of humiliating experiences, of absolute, utter devastation in my life, and the completeness of its annihilation of me as a personality was complete. Now, did I come out on the other side? Oh, shiny! Of course not. It took a process of growing and developing, you know, and knowing what all that was, you know. Because I was given so much in my moments of salvation. It's like, you know, my sister argues with me to this day, and, you know, she will, and she'll probably see this video and go, Yeah! Well, you know, that's okay. I got to say first. Nah, 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 nah. But in saying that, I told her, I said, look, when I got saved, I didn't know nothing. I didn't know any Bible. I didn't know any scriptures. But then the moment I got saved, whoosh, all these scriptures were flooded into my brain. You know, I said, God poured into me like outrageous amounts of information. No way I could know. I mean, it was absolutely insane the things that I was saying. We call it word of knowledge, you know, word of wisdom, you know, boom go from there. But I said, frankly, and I told her, I said, frankly, I haven't learned all that much more except for the experience of life applying what God had put into me when I got saved. I said, I really don't know that much more. I said, I didn't go out and study all the scriptures. I said, they were given to me at the time. I said, you know, it doesn't make any sense, you know, to you, but I said, that's just the way it is. You know, I said, there's other people out there, I'm sure that same thing happened, you know, it's kind of like, you know, so did I sit down, you know, afterwards and then start, you know, memorizing the Word of God? Study to show thyself approved. You know, workmen need not be ashamed, rightly dividing words here. No, I didn't. If anything, I kept trying to figure out what it was that I knew, and then I'd read it and go, oh, that's where it's from, okay. Then I'd go, well, yeah, but that don't make no sense, and I'd kind of try to figure it all out, you know, and then talk to God about it, you know. So God took that beautiful gift and knowledge and wisdom and stuff in a short period of time that came crashing in on me and my reality and then took 10 years to grind it into me. It wasn't just 10 years, but that 10 years really brought me, you know, to the end of my rope. You know? And then the process of life also after that with health brought the experience of it so that I would not be able to or I should say, I should be able, I would be able to relate to everyone in their circumstances because, frankly, I've been through a lot. You know, I haven't given birth yet, but boy, I tell you, man, there are some things about, you know, some of the surgeries you go through.
<laughs> I'll tell you. But uh, life, God wants to cause in you a living, breathing experience of being with the Son of God in you in order to minister one to another. So he will chastise you and bring that challenges in your life, not just to say, oh, the devil did it, oh, you know, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, you know, I'm, I'm prosperous, I'm healthy. I frankly look at everybody in the eye and say, I ain't prosperous, I ain't healthy. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and delivered him out of all of his fears. And if I had a million dollars, I'd still be saying, this poor man cried and the Lord delivered him out of all his fears. But it says, now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yields to peaceable fruit of righteousness unto which they are exercised thereby, because it gives us and produces muscle. Because, let's be real, you can't get a muscle unless you exercise it, and there is pain in the process of building up this muscle. That's just the way it works, and then all the, kind of like, the cells excrete into the blood, you know, or into the muscle tone. The muscle tone, you know, kind of pushes the, the yucky stuff out of the cells into the blood system. Blood system dumps it into your body. Then your body, you got to drink extra water in order to flush it out. You got to do all those flush things. You know, like, well, you know, it's the way the body works. But in faith and in the spiritual reality, you exercise by way of learning to go through the process of what God is doing in your life, chastening you. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but within all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now, I'd love to say that, you know, all the time that when I first got saved miraculously, that, you know, I ran out and didn't sin. <laughs> yeah, right. I'd love to say that, you know, those 10 years of going through uh, suffering and dying, that, you know, I didn't sin. Oh, dream on, buddy. You know, I'd love to say that, you know, I didn't challenge God and say, what the hell are you doing? You know, excuse me, <laughs> I'm me. You know, I was mad. I was furious. I damned things, you know. I mean, thank God he didn't take me up on it. I mean, God damn it, don't work. <laughs> you know, I mean, he doesn't damn things like that. He makes dams. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we make dams. God doesn't. So anyways, when I was in those things, I sin. Now, Jesus had been tempted like we are, but did not sin, because he gave us an example that we could look to so we wouldn't look at each other and say, that man of God, I want to be just like him. As he goes down the tubes. Because as soon as you lift someone up, they're going to fall down. As soon as you lift them up, after they fell down, you're going to hold them up. Because... God wants us to love one another as we are all sinners saved by grace. Your favorite, whoever it is, sins. Don't be surprised. They do sin. They seek not to sin, and their sin may be of a different nature or a different type, but all sin is falling short of the glory of God. It's that point that no one is 100% righteous. They're being made that way, slowly. They're already imputed righteousness to them, completely. They can't add anything to it, absolutely not. And they're going to keep working at it because that's kind of what helps to open the channels of relationship and develops less of a negative conscience, you know, that you're feeling like, I can't go to God. But you kind of go, I'm running to God. <laughs> and you feel like you've got no fear, but rather you want to be loved and you want to please the Father. He shall judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with judgment. The mountains shall bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass as showers that water the earth. In his days shall the righteous flourish and the abundance of peace so long as the moon endures. Glory to God. On earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Though the tender mercy of, through the tender mercy of our God, the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Peace by the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of all. 
These things I have spoken unto you, that you might in me have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There's two things about it, really. You're going to go through it, recognize you will encounter it. So deal with it. That's the point. You will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. He's overcome the world. That means you're going to do it. Don't try to deny it. Don't try to run from it. Don't try to hide from it. Just say, okay, Lord, what do you want me to learn in it? That's all. Is there something I can learn? Is there something I can apply? Is there something that I can do in my life from this? And if you do that, you will have peace.